Brother Mac is absolutely right. Some of those hymns have just amazing theology in them. Uh, I had a, a deacon one time tell me that when it comes to hymns, the deader the better. The longer they've been dead, the better the hymn is. <laughs> okay. It's a little morbid, but all right. That sounds good, I guess. Teach their own, but... I love when a kid gets loose in the sanctuary, especially when it's not mine. When it's not your kid, you think of you know words like, let the little ones come to me, and having faith is one of these. And when it's your kid, you think of things like sinners running from God. And It's all relative. It's both scriptural. I mean... <coughs> Well, we finished our series in 1 Peter at the end of the year, and we will be starting a series on 2 Peter, but not today. Everyone was almost about to turn there. I could feel it. We're going to be talking about a little bit something different today. We are going to be spending a lot of time in the Psalms. If you want to go ahead and turn to Psalm 28, that's the first place that we're going to be reading together. But to open us up this morning, I'd like to read Psalm 91, the first six verses for you. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to my Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for He will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His pinions and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. Pray with me, please. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this Lord's Day you've given us, this opportunity that we have to come together, to come together today, Lord, that we can worship you, that we can praise you, that we can sing songs of of worship that reveal the beautiful truths from your scriptures, that we can open those scriptures and we can read the words of life and light that you've given us. Lord, I ask this morning that you would open our hearts and our minds, that we would be prepared for your word, that we would receive it gladly, that we would correct in ourselves what needs to be corrected, that we would march on towards you, that we would grow in our sanctification, that we'd be prepared for all that this new year has for us, to glorify you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we made it to 2022. I don't know if you're one of those people who takes about the first quarter of the year to write the correct date, but even in my notes, I wrote 2021. Uh, It happens. Luckily, we don't write too many checks anymore, so, so that's not that big of a deal. But uh, I hope that everyone ate their black-eyed peas and collard greens yesterday. We didn't, and look what happened to the rest of my family. So hopefully y'all took care of that. But with all the, the craziness that the last couple of years have had for us, it, we can kind of look back at the previous two years, at this pandemic that's happened, with all of the results that have kind of snowballed downhill from there with the restrictions that have happened with the inability to see family members with people we know and love who've passed away from that with all the other things that have come along and been a result of that initial action it's really easy to become weary and disheartened by all that that's happened i know especially with this time of year after we've just finished Thanksgiving and Christmas, kind of the peak of everyone's excitement for the year of being around family, if you're a certain age, getting to open presents or, or whatever it may be, rejoicing that Lord has come and that we can celebrate that day. The end period of that, I called it last week when I was doing announcements, the purgatory between Christmas and uh, the start of work after the new year, right? It's just kind of a massive letdown. So we're dealing with all the things that have happened the years leading up to this, and now we're dealing with this time period where we've kind of thought about all the things that have happened. Maybe we're thinking of things we want to change or things we want to do differently in the new year. We're thinking, I really don't want to go back to work, or I really hope it snows harder so I never have to go back to work, or whatever it may be. We're thinking about the things that have happened, and a lot of times with this time of year, it can wear us down. 
It can make us weary. It can make us not really look forward to the things that are coming. But I want to take this Lord's Day to offer some encouragement to us. I want to take some time today to look to the scriptures, specifically to the Psalms, and to glean from them some of the things that the Lord has for us as His people. So if you'll go ahead and turn to Psalm 28, that's where I want to start this morning. And I hope that you're not too comfortable because I'm going to ask if you're able, if you could stand as we read this psalm together. You may have a different translation than I do, and that's okay if it'll confuse you to read and listen to me at the same time. I want us to just focus on what the psalmist is saying in this psalm and the next that we're going to read together as well. There's a great deal of encouragement here, but there's a specific type of encouragement that the Lord gives us in these two psalms, starting in Psalm 28, verse 1. To you, O Lord, I call. My rock, be not deaf to me, lest if you be silent to me, I become like those who go down to the pit. Hear the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cry to you for help, when I lift up my hands towards you, your most holy sanctuary. Do not drag me off with the wicked, with the workers of evil, who speak peace with their neighbors while evil is in their hearts. Give to them according to their work and according to the evil of their deeds. Give to them according to the work of their hands. Render them their due reward. Because they do not regard the works of the Lord or the works of His hands, He will tear them down and build them up no more. Blessed be the Lord, for He has heard the voice of my pleas for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In Him my heart trusts and I am helped. My heart exalts and with my song I give thanks to Him. The Lord is the strength of His people. He is the saving refuge of His anointed. O oh, save your people and bless your heritage. Be their shepherd and carry them forever. One more psalm if you'll read with me in Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very pleasant help, present help in times of trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. There is a river whose streams may glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage, the kingdoms totter, he utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come behold the works of the Lord, how He's brought desolation on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He brings the bow and shatters, breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. You can be seated. In those two psalms, I think a lot of times the scriptures so often can speak for themselves, especially in, in hours of need or in hours of praise where we can come to the scriptures on our own and just read. And I think the psalms are one of the best places for me in particular, that just speaks to my soul, that speaks to my heart. And no matter what I'm going through, I can read a psalm and I can understand how God has inspired this and moved this to affect not only the writer and the immediate reader, but us today. That in this time when I feel kind of worn out, when I've looked back at the last couple of years, when I've seen the opportunities that were missed or the things that were destroyed or the loved ones who've passed or all of those things that have happened, I can look to the Psalms, I can look to Psalm 28, I can look to Psalm 46, and I can see that I'm not the only person in the history of redemption who's ever felt that way. 
that I'm not the only person in, in, that belongs to the Lord who's ever felt like things were falling down or things weren't working right or the nations were raging or whatever it may be. I can come to the scriptures and I can see that those same things happen, but in the midst of that happening, while these things are happening around the psalmist, he says, I sing praises to God. I know that God is my fortress. I see the things happening around me, but I know that I should be still and acknowledge the Holy One of Israel. That He's unwavering, that He's unchanging, that there's nothing that can thwart the plans of God, much less my own feelings or emotions about the things happening to me or around me. But there's three things in these Psalms in particular that, that I think are, are key as we move forward today that we need to take with us that we rejoice in God's providence. Now the psalmist says that the Lord is with him. That God is a fortress, an ever-present help in his time of trouble. That we have strength in God's power, not in our own, not in my own frailty, my own ability, my own health, or whatever it may be, but my strength is in God's strength. And God's strength is much greater than I can even imagine. And then lastly, that we have no reason to fear because we rest in his will and his way. That when the nations and all of those things around us, when those who hate the word of the Lord, when those who hate Jesus and his followers are, are attacking or coming in or bringing pressure on us or whatever it may be, we fully rest in the fact that I have a God with a will and a way that includes me. That's part of who I am and part of who my life, that his purposes can't be changed. It may not be every day that we feel that pressure or, or that, that crushing blow. It may not even be now. You may be in the total opposite area right now thinking, man, this year is going to be awesome. I'm having a great time. This is going to be great. But I can promise you that the, as the psalmist is saying here, I promise one day it will come to that point. Or one days it will come to that point. Now, there's many times in our life where it comes to that part, but we need to be prepared in our hearts, in our minds, prepared for when the nations do rage, when the mountains fall into the sea, whatever calamity happens around us nationally or individually with us and ourselves, that we're prepared for that with the knowledge that the Lord is with us. With the knowledge that our strength relies in Christ alone. You guys know I love to tell stories where I'm the butt of my own jokes, so here's another one. <clears throat> Uh, we, me and my dad, we, uh, we decided to go do some bike riding. After I'd gotten really sick, some of you people probably don't know the story yet, but I'd gotten very sick to the point I almost passed away. And almost dying at 26 makes you change things. And uh, so I decided I was going to start bike riding with my dad. It's something he'd got into. We could spend more time together. Of course, he was in New Mexico and I was in southeast Texas. But we decided we're going to set a date. We're going to pick a ride that we're going to go on. So we picked this 100-mile charity bike ride around Galveston Bay. I know, not wise for my very first ride. But leading up to it, I saw my dad's counsel, and I said, well, what do I need to do to prepare? And some of you have already heard the story that my dad would plan vacations down to the minute, including bathroom stops. So he had a very detailed list of what I needed to do. Exactly how many miles each day I needed to ride, the, the levels of incline I needed to, to do on my rides, and all of these things put together. And so I followed that plan just religiously. I, I got on my bike, and, and I rode in, this, in the heat. And I have to clarify something for you all as well. It isn't hot here, okay? You can't whew, and see the air part here, okay? Y'all don't have humidity here, right? So I'm doing this in, in, the, in the foothills of southeast Texas with 97 degree weather and 99.9% .9 humidity. It was a very funny picture to see me on a bike doing all this. But, but I, I pushed through the pain of it. I pushed through the pain of my legs. I pushed through recovery days. I pushed through the heat and I did all this and the time came for our ride and we did it. I was able to, to uh, set a goal with my father and accomplish this thing that we were able to do together, and we rolled 100 miles all the way halfway around Galveston Bay. It was a wonderful trip. It was a wonderful experience up until about mile 87. There was this long stretch, about 100 feet. That's as far as you can go in a straight line in East Texas. There was about 100 feet stretch. We opened up from some of the trees, and there was just the long, tall grass. We had a crosswind. And I'm pedaling, and I all of a sudden kind of realize in this long stretch where my mind wanders that my legs are about to set on fire. 
And so I'm pushing harder and harder, and I'm literally screaming out hymns at the top of my lungs just to get distracted from the fact that my legs are about to fall off my body. You don't know confusion until you're screaming, bringing in the sheaths, as some guy with a Darwin fish on the back of his helmet looks at you, <laughs> flying past you on his bicycle. That's witnessing, guys. I don't know what else to tell you. But we did it. We accomplished it. And that next year, we said, we're going to do it again. So we, we just set the date. We, we picked the ride. It was going to be shorter this year. I thought, piece of cake. I conquered 100 miles. It was nothing last time. But this year, I didn't have the opportunity to ride my bike as much. My, my wife's work schedule changed. She was working on the Saturdays. I couldn't spend all day Saturday riding. And I thought, well, I'll just go to the gym and use the little incumbent bike that the purple-haired people do whenever they're just sitting there strolling along. Got about 30 minutes every day, and I thought, well, this may be good enough. I think I might be well enough. Never got on my bike for more than 10 miles at a time. When that day came, I made it a full 12 miles before my legs would not let me go any further. I became so tight in all of my joints. My body wasn't used to sitting upright on a bicycle pedaling. It was used to the nice little lazy boy that they have on the recumbent bikes watching ESPN for 30 minutes at a time. I was not prepared. And when the day of the challenge came, when it came to the point where I needed to be prepared, when I needed and I knew and I had all of this opportunity to prepare for that day, I was woefully, inadequately prepared for it. And the same thing rings true when it comes to the times in our lives when we can identify with the first half of Psalm 46 or the first half of Psalm 28, when it feels like there's enemies around us, when there's pressure, there's pain, there's discomfort, there's all of these things. And if we are fully prepared, if we can rest in the promises of God, if we're relying on His strength, you will make it through. You will be successful. You'll be sanctified in it. But if you're not prepared, if you're not reading the Scripture, if you're not walking in the Spirit, if you're not following God's Word and His will in your life and in your family, when that pressure is applied to you, it's a very difficult, difficult time. It's much easier to prepare and be sanctified all of your life, killing the flesh every day, than to wake up one day to a disastrous event, to a disastrous time, to a death in the family, to an illness, whatever it may be, and then all of a sudden go, I need God. I need to scramble for God. I need to find that strength in and of this moment. I need to find a strength that comes from the Lord. In Deuteronomy chapter 31 Starting in verse 1, there's a very pertinent story to what we're discussing today. Deuteronomy 31, starting in verse 1, says, So Moses continued to speak these words to all Israel. And he said to them, I'm 120 years old today. I'm no longer able to go out and come in. The Lord has said to me, you shall not go over this Jordan. The Lord your God himself will go over before you. He will destroy these nations before you so that you shall dispossess them. And Joshua will go over ahead of you as the Lord has spoken. And the Lord will do to them as he did to Sion and Og, the kings of the Amorites, and to their land when he destroyed them. And the Lord will give them over to you. You shall do to them according to the whole commandment that I have commanded you. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. For it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Then Moses summoned Joshua and said to him in the sight of all Israel, Be strong and courageous, for you shall go with this people into the land that the Lord has sworn to their fathers to give to them. And you shall put them in possession of it. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear. Do not be dismayed. This is another example of Scripture. There's an enormous transition happening at this point in redemptive history where not only is Moses the, the hero in our eyes that has come to Egypt, the first uniting leader who God used to bring about the plagues. He used to spread the Red Sea. He used to guide them through the wilderness and he's leaving. He's no longer in charge. He's not going with them, which brings the second biggest event is they are moving into a very dangerous situation. 
They're crossing the Jordan. They're going into this land, a land that's promised to them, but a land that they have to fight for, a land that's guaranteed to them, but a land that they're uncertain about. And one of those things in and of itself would be cause enough for concern. One of those things in and of itself would cause you to doubt or have trouble or or be anxious about it, but both of these things are happening at the same time. God does these things like this in Scripture to make it very plainly obvious to us as the people reading it, the people who've read it all throughout the centuries, that this could not possibly happen apart from God. That this massive change up in leadership, this massive transition from the desert to the land that's promised to them is only going to happen, and it's very clear from Scripture, it's only going to happen because the Lord is with them. That their strength is only in the Lord. They should not fear because the Lord is with them. In the midst of this uncertainty, Moses reminds them that God goes before you. That God is always with his people. We are not a bunch of Hebrews in a desert about to cross a Jordan with a new leader. but We are still God's people. And the same God who was with them in this time of uncertainty, in this time of transition, in this time of change, in this time where they didn't really fully comprehend or know what the future hold or, or what was going to happen with them, that same God who says, go and I will go before you, says the same thing to you and me today. That we should not fear, that we should have courage, that we should take hold of the promises that he has for us. Too many times we forget what Jeremiah says in 32, 17. The Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth. By your great power and by your outstretched arm, nothing is too hard for you. We can read those words. We can understand what he's saying. We can understand the theology of how how he's saying God is all-powerful. We can understand those things. But does our heart fully realize it in the moment? Does our faith fully depend and know and lean on that? Because all too often we're guilty of limiting God's power in our own mind. We're guilty of limiting His role here on earth. And we think that God cannot do this or may not do this. Even if we don't say it out loud, we may think it or feel it. That this thing that I'm going through, that God is not powerful enough to do it. And instead of keeping His commands, our flesh lies to us and says that my way is is better. That in order to get out of this earthly trouble, I'm going to do this earthly thing to figure this out. It may in the moment figure it out, but ultimately, eternally, the consequences of that action is rejecting God's word, is rejecting God's way. Our flesh will try to convince us that we are alone, that it's just me, that I'm some pioneer that I don't have a God that's going before me. And quickly we spiral into a pattern of disobedience resulting in despair when we forget the God that goes before us. Instead, we can look at the example of Psalm 59. Another one, it says, in this psalm, the author is coming to the Lord in a time of trouble. Their enemies are all around them. They bring suffering on them. But instead of despair, they look to God. Starting in verse 14, he says, each evening they come back howling like dogs and prowling about the city. They wander about for food and growl if they do not get their fill. But I will sing of your strength. I will sing aloud of your steadfast love in the morning. For you have been to me a fortress and a refuge in the day of my distress. O oh, my strength, I will sing praises to you, for you, O oh God, are my fortress, the God who shows steadfast love. Now, in, in order to keep our hearts and our minds on this track, we have to avoid that pitfall of disobedience leading to despair. We have to avoid the, the voice of our flesh that says, you have to disobey Christ in order to have this turn out the right way. You have to reject the wisdom of the Scriptures, the wisdom of God, in order for this to be a good outcome for you. That won't lead down a good path. And there are three key things I want to go over that I think are going to help us (coughs) to take heart in the new year. Three things if you're a note taker. That's one, two, and three. The first is to remember who you serve. To remember that the Holy One of Israel, the one who created the cosmos with his very breath, he is your master and king. He is the one you serve, not the flesh, not anyone else on this earth, but Christ. 
Remember who it is that you serve. Remember that you have marching orders directly from Him. Remember that if you're washed with the blood of Christ, that means something more than just poetic, fuzzy language. It means that your heart has been changed, that it's been made new, that all of these things that you once were, you've cast them off and you now follow Christ and Christ alone. Not that Christ is some person you go to for counsel or that you see some good things in the Bible that talk about some nice things, but that alone Christ is your master and king. That alone Christ is the one that we follow. To know that he's always there, he's always in your midst, he's always going before you. The second thing is to remember who you are. Now, don't think of that from an earthly perspective. We're not talking about the selfish ambition that comes with the sinful flesh, but the who you are now in Christ. The who you've been turned into. I think it's very uh, coincidental that the uh, passage on our bulletin today is, uh, speaks directly to this, and I'd planned it before I even saw those. God works in mysterious ways. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 16, it says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Remember who you are in Christ now that He is your Master and that you belong to Him. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me. Christ didn't give Himself up for just a random group of people. Paul says He gave Himself up for me. That He knew me. And then he gave himself up anyway for me so that I could be this new creature, this new creation. If you were a Canaanite or an Egyptian or a Philistine, you had reason to be afraid. You had reason to be very afraid. You had reason to fear Yahweh. If you are still in your sin, you have reason to fear. I cannot offer you any hope. I cannot offer you any joy or any comfort. However, if you have repented of your sin and placed your faith and hope in Christ alone, there is absolutely nothing to fear in this world, the next, earthly things or spiritual things. Nothing to fear. If you're walking in the Spirit, if you're walking in Christ, if you've been covered by the blood of the Lamb that died for you, there is nothing to fear. The world can do nothing to you of any real significance. According to earthly standards, sure, they can do all sorts of things to you. They can take your home, take your money. They can take your family's life. They can take your very life. But God goes before you. God is our strength. God is our fortress. He's our master who loves us, who not only redeems us, but calls us his children. Oh, to be the child of someone who could never sin or do wrong by me. We have no reason to fear. We've been adopted and made children of the king and heirs with Christ. The last point is remember who your family is. Now there's really two parts to this. I can't just leave it in a fully spiritual sense, but in an earthly sense, we've been given roles as mothers and fathers and spouses and daughters and sons that are important and integral to God's God's plan. From the very beginning of creation, He designed us to work in such a way. He's given us certain roles within the family unit, and we should honor those things to be the best person we can be within those roles that God has assigned to us. And by fulfilling our individual roles to our greatest ability, we not only glorify God, but we frustrate the enemy that longs not only for dysfunction in our singular role, but elimination of God's design for family. It's important to remember that physical part of that, but also along with that is to remember our family that is much bigger, greater, and vaster than the one we share a dwelling with. To remember that we have a family, that we're brothers and sisters in Christ, through the power of God, through our redemption, what Christ has done for us, He's not only changed our hearts and minds and made us His child, He's given us a family far greater than we could ever imagine. 
He's given us a family. And in our context here, physically, that we can see we have the church. Remember your family. Not just the ones in your dwelling, but the ones who are around you. In Matthew 12, 50, Jesus makes a point of saying this, that while he was still speaking to the people, his mother and his brother stood outside asking to speak to him, but he replied, <coughs> excuse me, to the man who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand towards his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Jesus didn't reject his earthly family, but he said there's a family that's greater, a family that's bigger and broader, has a more wide purpose than just the one that I physically have. Yes, it's important, but there's also a family with a mission to glorify God. Remember that your family is more than earthly relatives. We've been brought together in the love of God towards one another. That outside of Christ, we may or may not, absolutely not, in some cases, have any sort of bond or connection or anything like that with one another. But in Christ, He's brought us together. He's given us individual gifts. And He said, use these gifts, use these things to edify and build up your brothers and sisters around you. Don't forget who your family is. As we make our plans for this next year, be sure to take time to remember the one you serve. Be sure to remember who it is that you belong to. Be sure to take time to remember who you are now. Not then, not in the flesh, but who you are now in Christ, who your master is, how he's changed you and redeemed you. And remember the role you play in your family, both your earthly family and your spiritual family. But like I said earlier, if you, if you don't know Christ, I can't offer you any hope in any of this. If you don't know the one who's redeemed man by his own blood, there's no real hope that can be given. You can hope in your, your wealth. You can hope in the health that you have. You can hope that these things hold strong, and they may for a while, but it eventually will fail. You can hope in yourself. You can say, I would never do wrong by myself. I will always look out for what I do but you will fail yourself too. There is but one being in this universe with the strength, the wisdom, and the might to deliver you from all of the things that this world has, and that's Christ and Christ alone. If you know Him, remember those three things as we start this year, as we're coming out of our our purgatory of January, as we go into the new year remembering who my God is, who I am now, and who my family is. And if you don't have that God, if you don't have a changed heart, and if you don't have a family, today's the day to change that. To start off this year as a new member of the family of God. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for all the blessings you've given us, Lord. Thank you for this wonderful season that we just passed out of where we got to spend time with family and friends, where we got to celebrate your incarnation. We got to celebrate your arrival here on earth. Holy Spirit, I ask as we continue on that you would give us strength that you would give us wisdom, that you would give us the thought at the forefront of our minds to remember who you are, that you're the Holy One, that you have all power, all wisdom, all might, that there's nothing impossible for you. Help us to remember that we belong to you, that we are your children, you are our Father, that we've been changed and made new by you. Help us to remember one another, to remember the family of God, and the families that you've blessed us with, that we could use the gifts you've given us so that both of those groups can glorify you in new and amazing ways this year. Lord, be with our church this year as we we pursue you in the best way we can, Lord. We are not perfect. No earthly institution is perfect. Even your church, we fail you sometimes, Lord. But God, I ask that you would redeem us, renew us, and give us a fixed purpose for your glory in any and everything that may come our way. That everything we plan will be absolutely infused with the idea of glorifying you in all things. In Jesus' name, amen.